Now, one of the most essential branches of e of England. <laughs> There's a knock at the door. There's a government agent outside, whether it's a law enforcement officer or a red code. If this were 1761, you should be concerned because normally they wouldn't knock on the door. They would just kick the door in and start searching your stuff. 1761, there's a guy named James Otis, who is a Massachusetts lawyer and political activist. And he said the following in a very famous speech, which gave foundation to the Fourth Amendment. Now, one of the most essential branches of English liberty is the freedom of one's house. A man's house is his castle. And while he is quiet, he is well guarded as a prince in his castle. This was the formation of the Fourth Amendment. I'm Drew Breezy. Welcome to Failure to Stop. This is the number one channel where society and culture meets law enforcement. And if you like this content, I want you to smash the like button and I want you to share this with your Aunt Sally and her sister, who is probably your mother, if I'm doing the math right. Hit that notification bell, share it far and wide, and come join the fun. So we're gonna talk about the Fourth Amendment, but very specifically about the search warrant aspect of the Fourth Amendment. And what I asked of some of you, or a lot of you who saw my uh, Instagram post and uh, the failure to stop Instagram post, I was essentially asking for a person, a crime, and a, a location so I can construct a search warrant. I appreciate everybody that contributed. There were plenty of people that contributed to the fun. There was one, though, that stood out, and I used most of that in uh, the formation of the, the, the search warrant, and I think we're going to have a good time with it, but you're going to have to stick around to see what I'm talking about, and yes, that is a marketing trick. So the Fourth Amendment specifically says, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. So let's talk about that. The, yes, a man's home is his castle. That obviously applies to women, but you know you never know in today's society. I'm going to walk you through an actual search warrant that I wrote based on a fictitious crime. Uh, you'll see what I mean. For the purposes of this video, I'm Paul Spinetti. I'm detective with the Tansy County Sheriff's Office. I've been conducting a, a methamphetamine ring investigation here in Tansy County, New Mexico, for uh, about a year now. I've gathered a bunch of probable cause and then something significant happened last week or maybe a couple days ago where we had a concerned citizen come forward and, and provide us with some information. Uh, I verified the information that was provided to us. We made sure that we worked with the uh, person's attorney um, that they were not going to be offered any immunity for providing us this information. And then we took the investigation to the next level. Next thing you know, we're in the situation we're in and I need a search warrant. Well, what I need to do is I need to gather all those facts together. I need to put them in a very digestible form for the court to understand, for the judge to understand. And to get to that place, I want people to know that the Tansy County Sheriff's Office is going to have supervisors that are going to review that search warrant. The template I used for the search warrant to create this video is quite old. It's not from the 1700s, but it was from when I, it was based off of a search warrant that I wrote way back when. Uh, the template is anyway. It may be a little bit different in your jurisdiction. As always, it's fictitious anyway, please follow the laws and rules of your jurisdiction. I want you to understand something about search warrants. There are three parts, three elements to a search warrant. First is the actual search warrant itself, where you establish what uh, jurisdiction you're in, what gives you that jurisdiction, and the judge who gives the order has to have jurisdiction in the, in the place where you're serving the search warrant. Sometimes that's why federal uh, magistrates are used because they cover the United States, as long as a United States code is being broken. You need to describe the place that you're going to search. You need to describe the people that are in control of that. And in the search warrant, you need to describe exactly what it is they're doing that would lead you to believe that there's evidence within that structure, whether it's a business, a residence, a car, even uh, even though there's exceptions for that. But uh, you need to you need to establish that an actual law has been broken, that you have some kind of objective basis to get in there. You're going to gather all of your facts. The The first part is that is the search warrant. There's a second part. And, and by the way, the judge signs the first part. The first part, which is the search warrant, is essentially the judge's order. So you're going to leave that with the person uh, or you're going to leave that 
at the premises that you search. People need to know that this was authorized by the court, that we didn't just willy-nilly kick in their door like they did in the 1700s, and that this is the search warrant and this is the judge that authorized it. The second part of this whole thing is called an affidavit for search warrant. It, it is a uh, basically a repeat of the search warrant itself because it describes the lands and the grounds and everything that you want to search. It talks about who should be in control of it. It talks about what laws are being broken. But then it goes into some very specific things that are required by the courts to convince them that you have probable cause to do this intrusion on someone's uh, privacy within their castle. You have to go very detailed and way out of your way to make sure that the courts understand you know what you're talking about, you know what laws are being broken, and that you believe that there are fruits of the crime in the place that you wanna search where the people have expectation of privacy. It, it gives a statement, what, what sometimes we refer to as the hero statement. It kind of talks about who you are, what your qualifications are, and how you know that this is illegal. Then it goes into the story of, of what's happening. I want to go through in detail what uh, I came up with for the search warrant that I wrote so you understand and try to contextualize it. At the end of the affidavit for search warrant, you're going to sign it as the person that's swearing or affirming, and the judge is going to sign it. Now, what normally happens with the affidavit for search warrant is the courts will keep a copy and the prosecutor will keep a copy and maybe you as the investigator will have a copy, but the defendant doesn't get a copy of that. Not yet. That's not released to the public. That's under the court's seal. What essentially it means is that, hey, I'm a judge and these investigators came in here and I have in writing exactly what their investigation is and they have convinced me as a judge that... Uh, there's enough probable cause to search where you want to search. I'm giving you this context because of mar lago uh, perhaps Breonna Taylor, uh, th that case was a search warrant case. Um, I I'm giving you th that context because sometimes they don't release the um, affidavit in support of the search warrant. In the case of mar lago they did release the affidavit, but if, if you remember, it was just redacted, 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 and there was just black lines all over the place because the government doesn't want to give away their case. So normally the prosecutor just wants to hold those cards close to the vest. The judge for sure has seen it and is convinced that there's probable cause. But again, the defense doesn't get this until it's time for trial or, until, uh, or upon indictment, perhaps. You don't want to release that to the public because then the defense is going to get their shot to see what's what's actually inside of it. I have my suspicions about why they didn't release the uh, affidavit for Trump, but uh, that, those are just my opinions. The judge's order in the search warrant can uh, specify whether it's a no-knock warrant or or not. Um, essentially, all warrants that are going to be served are assumed to be knock and announce warrants, which means you have to announce who you are and make sure that you knock on the door prominently and that they and we and you give them ample time to come answer the door like a reasonable amount of time to come answer the door there are times when the stuff inside is so dangerous you don't want them destroying evidence or you don't want them gathering up stuff to to harm the officers that are trying to serve the warrant so at times the courts will authorize a no knock warrant if the officer or the law enforcement agency or the prosecutor requests it it's kind of rare, especially nowadays, that you request a no-knock warrant. There isn't really a piece of evidence that can be destroyed other than weapons, firearms, booby traps, bombs, and stuff like that, that that can do harm to surprise people like that. As a matter of fact, the Breonna Taylor case was centered around the no-knock warrant aspect of this thing, but they knocked and announced just like they were supposed to do. And they made their presence known, uh, even though Kenneth Walker, the, the boyfriend, still claims that he thought he was being... Um, home invaded. And there were neighbors that saw, that, that heard, you know, Louisville police search warrant. And uh, they announced who they were and they were knocking for quite a while before the door even opened. And then, of course, Kenneth Walker started shooting at police officers who were announcing themselves as police officers. They're creating legislation based on that. They are creating legislation to remove the no knock based on uh, Breonna Taylor being killed. But Ironically, they knocked and announced just like they were supposed to. There was a no-knock option, but they did not choose to use it. And I can tell you from experience and any cop worth his weight in salt that has served a search warrant, you want to announce your presence. You don't want anyone to think they're being home invaded. There isn't any evidence that's going to be destroyed in that 
quick of time that you can't get to one or two that you want to put the citizen in danger. And obviously you don't want any of the officers that are trying to serve the warrant in danger. Uh, this is something that's authorized by the court. It's not something arbitrary that the officers decided. So we got two of the three parts down. The third part is what's known as the receipt or the return. And what it is, is it's an itemized list of everything that was taken from the residence and where it was taken from. And that receipt is left with the defendant or it's left on the premises. There are two things that are left on the premises when you serve a search warrant, the search warrant itself and the receipt. So they know what you took. You don't leave the affidavit for search warrant. There's never a guarantee that a prosecutor is going to approve your search warrant. There's never a guarantee you're going to get a past your supervisor anyway. They're probably going to tell you to, beyond fixing typos, you know, fix elements of probable cause or elements of the case itself. And you have to show sufficient probable cause. Uh, you're never going to make it to the court if you don't pass the muster of the prosecutor. So you're going to need to list out some very detailed information of how you have probable cause to believe that there's evidence in that residence. And then third, the judge always has the option to say, I'm not signing this. I'm not going to issue an order for you to go search that place because I don't believe there's enough probable cause. And the judge may instruct you, may help you or guide you and just kind of say, hey, this is kind of what you're missing or this is what I'm looking for or this is a stretch and I'm not comfortable signing it and we need to make sure that we're doing the best job that we can do. My goal in any search warrant that I created or wrote was to make sure that I eliminate any questions the judge would have before the judge asked them. Let's, let's review the, the probable cause. I, I'll put up, uh, this is what the search warrant itself looks like. So you can kind of go through that. As you can see that, you know, it establishes it's the 50th judicial circuit in uh, the state of New Mexico. I made that up. That's arbitrary. Uh, Tansy County is, you know, obviously made up. But l look how specific I have to list. This is the search warrant itself. Look how specific I have to list the... Um, the description of the, the residence to be searched. You have to be 100% sure that you have convinced a judge that you know exactly where it is that you're going to search. It's not just a guess that it's this house. You have to say specifically, it, you have to give an indication that you were there looking at the place. Um, in this instance, I used uh, 308 uh, Negra Arroyo Lane in New Mexico because that was from Breaking Bad. That was a great suggestion somebody gave me. So we're going to go, we're going to break down some of the probable cause or, or some sample probable cause of what would have happened uh, if I were investigating um, Breaking Bad. Family residents constructed a block material off white in color with deep red trim, a brown garage door, and a tan roof. It faces north towards Negra Arroyo Lane. The structure is the fourth residence from Moriah Trace. Uh, the residence is marked on the exterior wall to the left of the garage with the numerals 308 affixed. It, it's, there's also a statement in there about what I would like to search. So it says all lands, ground structures, and vehicles that may be found on the above property. Sometimes you have detached garages. Sometimes you have tool sheds. Sometimes you have RVs. And you want to make sure that the judge is clear on what you're looking to get because it's, if it's a place that can hide evidence, you want to be able to search it. It also talks about who it's under the control of. White male Walter Hart. Hartwell White or white female Skyler White or any other John or Jane Doe whose Christian names are unknown to your affiant or affiant. That's uh, the person that files the affidavit is known as an affiant or affiant, depending on what part of the country you're from or what law school you went to. The last part of this is is uh, the judge's order, essentially. The last part of the search warrant is the judge's order, and it says, therefore, you're commanded with such proper and necessary assistance as may be necessary in the daytime or in the nighttime or on Sunday as the exigencies of the occasion may demand or require to enter and search the aforesaid residence. And it goes on to talk about who should be in there. Uh, it does say that we need to provide within 10 days uh, the receipt it says specifically in here that you need to prov you need to bring the whatever you seized before the court uh, within ten days. Most uh, ninety nine point nine percent of the time, the judges judges will say, "Take that out, just show me the receipt," because they don't want to be you know they don't want to have to view the evidence. They just they want to view the receipt though, and we do that by filing it with the clerk of the court, and the judge can pull a copy of it anytime they want. So the judge signs the search warrant. And again, this is what's, what gets left behind so that the people are very clear that this was not an arbitrary search, that a judge authorized it. Now, here's the affidavit for search warrant. This is the part that I told you that is kind of kept secret until indictment. 
and it talks about uh, Detective Paul Spinetti of the Tansy County Sheriff's Office, who's duly sworn that they're a, uh, a reputable citizen of the state of New Mexico, and they have reason to believe that certain residence uh, contains uh, drugs uh, located in Tansy County, described as follows. That's essentially just the cut and paste of the previous uh, page. Also in here, I'm going to list all of the, the criminal offenses that are being violated that uh, I want to pull evidence out of there from. Then it goes into what we call the hero statement. It says the, the affiant or affiant Paul Spinetti is a member of the Tansy County Sheriff's Office and has been so employed since September of 2010. Uh, it says that I've been assigned to the drug trafficking section as a detective since 2016. I've conducted numerous criminal investigations. I've authored and executed several search warrants, and I've participated in the execution of search warrants involving drug crimes, economic crimes, computer crimes, and money laundering investigations, which will come into this in a little bit. It says your, your affiant is a graduate of the Federal Drug Police's 80-hour dangerous drugs investigator course. That's important. That's an important statement. It's showing your credibility. It's showing that you know what you're talking about. And if you talk about training and experience within this affidavit, they want to know what your training is. For the next paragraph, it starts right off. It tells the story from kind of beginning to end, but you really can't give the full investigation because the, the court's not going to have time to read that. This is definitely the Cliff Notes version with great detail because you want the court to know and understand what your probable cause is. So this basically says since January of 2022, I, you know, Detective Spinetti has been working on this uh, case with the federal drug police. And we believe that there's a, uh, an organization in Tansy County by the name of uh, the Heidelberg cartel. They're a drug trafficking organization involved in the trafficking of methamphetamine. And we just got lucky because on September 21st of 2022, a guy named Jesse Pinkman voluntarily contacted the federal drug police with information about the manufacturing and trafficking of methamphetamine in the Tansy County area. And uh, we, we, as investigators, have known about Jesse Pinkman's involvement in the drug trafficking organization known as the Heidelberg cartel. I go on to say that Jesse Pinkman showed up at headquarters unsolicited. That's an important thing. He wasn't, in other words, he's not doing this for personal gain or he's not doing this to absolve him of any of the charges. He showed up on his own. We didn't have him in custody. He came and knocked on our door and gave us information. And if you think that doesn't happen, oh boy, does it ever happen. So he showed up unsolicited and voluntarily agreed to cooperate with us. We even had him sign paperwork through his attorney that said he's not immune from any prosecution, that he's giving his information uh, of free will. And he gave us uh, his uh, signature and said, I don't want to be kept confidential. I, wanted, I want people to know it was me. So that gets put into the search warrant itself that it says uh, he came, he agreed to cooperate with law enforcement under the condition that we do not keep him anonymous. That's another one of the questions the judge might have that you can clear up before you even get that far. So I say that uh, the affidavit that he signed, that his attorney looked at, is attached to this affidavit as Exhibit C, and it's incorporated by reference. You want to attach any supporting documents just in case the judge wants to review it. I go on to say in the probable cause here that Jesse Pinkman directed us to a place known as 308 Negra Arroyo Lane, which is, of course, the residence to be searched. And he told us that it was the family home of Walter Hartwell White, who is the head of the drug trafficking organization. I wanted to verify what he told me about this being Walter White's residence. So I, as uh, Detective Spinetti, contacted Randy Rafters, who is an investigator with the Tansy Electric Co-op. And uh, Mr. Rafters verified that the residence had electrical services, uh, an account in the name of Walter Hartwell White. So there's Good supporting evidence there, and we're convincing the judge that this is Walter White's house. I went on to say, additionally, your affiants uh, searched the Tansy County Property Appraiser database, and I determined that Walter White was actually the owner of 308 Negro Royal Lane. Good statement to put in there. And also that there were two vehicles in the driveway, and when you run those tags, they both come back to Walter and Skyler White. So they're parking their cars there. The property appraiser says, that, says they own the place. And on top of that, 
Um, there's electrical services in Walter White's name. It's a pretty good indicator, enough to, to please the court that this is Walter White's residence. I went on to say Jesse Pinkman provided information in photographs from his cell phone, which he alleged was a large quantity of methamphetamine in bundles of wrapped U.S. currency. And he said that the photos were taken from inside the garage at 308 Negro Arroyo Lane and that the photos were recent. So I've got to prove a couple of things. I have to be able to say that I understand that he's saying this is methamphetamine. This is how I, I believe him. I also have to kind of say this is, uh, I, I believe him that he was on the inside of the residence because of this. Through training and experience, your affiant identified the unique markings on the packaging and the substance contained therein as having similar appearance to the trademark of the Heidelberg cartel and that previous Heidelberg cartel seizures that were contained in the same packaging were tested at the Lumber Chef lab of the Federal Drug Police in Minnesota. So what I'm saying is I'm looking at currency and I'm looking at what I believe is meth, but it's in packaging that's familiar to me as an investigator. And I didn't tell Jesse Pinkman that I knew that. He's offering that this, this methamphetamine is in the garage at this house that I want to search. I also said to verify that this was probably going to be the inside of this residence is, I said that I looked on a, 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 a public website, Zillow, Realtor.com, one of those, and they still had pictures of the inside of the residence left up on the website. And I clicked around and I found a garage shot and it looked exactly like the shot that was in his photo. I, I said it kind of um, in, in a more abbreviated terms than that, but that's exactly, that, that's how I verified that he is probably telling the truth about being inside the garage. And to prove that, it was, it, the, that the photos were recent, I could see in the background that there was a YouTube channel up it was the failure to stop YouTube channel, and I could tell that it was the Night Shift program. I Googled it. I found Night Shift. I liked the content, so I started following it. I s smashed the like button, and I said to verify the date on the video, which was Tuesday, September 20th, I checked YouTube, and I saw that that's when it was uh, published, and I recognized the wrinkled clothing of the male host and the shoulder and the knee of the female host. So that's how I established that this was recent, and this is how I established this was within the house. Now it starts to get juicy. It says that on Friday, September 23rd, which, you know, as I'm recording this was yesterday, a surveillance was established at an investigator named Michael D. Cop, Mike D. Cop, and he's with the Pride Police Department, but he's on the Federal Drug Police's task force with me. And he was able to see Walter White pacing inside the residence from the street which is important. It, it, it shows that we weren't hiding in his bushes. We weren't on his property where we shouldn't be. It's just that we were out, he was out in the street conducting surveillance. At approximately 10 a.m., Jesse Pinkman agreed to do a controlled and recorded telephone call to Walter White. And I personally, as the affiant, I listened to the instructions that Jesse Handy Pinkman gave to Walter White. In other words, I didn't let him walk away with the phone, so I know exactly what he told him and, and how he said it. I said in my probable cause statement here, during the conversation, Pinkman asked White if he got rid of the 10 keys yet. Walter White replied, no, it's all here. So what we did in that statement there was determine that there were 10 keys in the place where he was. We had surveillance on where he was, so we knew he was inside. And what Pinkman asked him in that phone call was, it, could you make a care package of money and ice for me and throw it in my leather overnight bag that I left behind? So Pinkman told White that he was gonna meet him at a Best Buy parking lot near the residence, and he would wait in the parking lot for him. Pinkman, uh, he, he said that he'd just be sitting there in the parking lot, and, and White agreed without hesitation and said he'd be there at 10.30. As we maintain surveillance on the residence, I put right in the probable cause. At 308 Negro Royal Lane, nobody came in and nobody left. So while we were there watching, nobody came in and nobody left. In other words, if you want to get into a house to search it and you believe there's dr there are drugs in there, you have to make sure that you account for everybody that's come in there because maybe they have brought drugs in there or maybe they have removed drugs and the, the court might lean towards, well, we don't know if there's drugs in there anymore. That person could have taken that out. So that's why I put that in there. 
At 10.22 a.m., Walter White was observed walking out the front door carrying a, well, wouldn't you know it, a tan leather duffel bag with the initials JHP embroidered on the side in white letters. And I, I added a probable cause statement that, that's gonna, that a judge is going to like. Uh, because it's true. The strap appeared to be pulling on White's shoulder as if the duffel bag contained something heavy. You don't want to go in there and just say, well, he w- he walked out with a duffel bag and have the judge say, how do you know something's in there? I took that question away before he could even ask it. As Walter White was approaching the driver's side of his car in the driveway, investigator cop, Michael D. Cop, Mike D. Cop, and I and I identified ourselves as law enforcement officers and we were wearing protective vests that said uh, drugs police across the front and the back and we had our neck badges hanging out. There's no question he knew who we were. At least that's what I want the judge to know. Walter Hartnell White dropped the bag and he asked me if I remembered him from chemistry class at Cleotha High School. I told him I most certainly did and then unsolicited without me saying anything else, White said, quote, I guess you got me good then. The rest is stacked in the garage and there's a bunch of money hidden in the walls, end quote. Uh, He asked me then if I had a search warrant, and uh, I said, no, but I'm going to get one, and he requested that I call his attorney, some guy by the name of Saul Goodman. I bring this before the court. That's the end of the story. That's where we're at, where we took the the judge on a journey from uh, essentially 1761 all the way to January of 2022, and then from January 20th of 22 to uh, yesterday, when I uh, observe, when all of this went down, I swore under oath, I gave proper probable cause that this is not an arbitrary search, that I do realize the weight of having to, sh- to prove that there are fruits of a crime within this residence, and here are the crimes that I think are being violated. This is what I'm asking for. This is what I'm hoping you'll allow me to do, Judge. Uh, I pray for the issuance of the search warrant in due form, and I want to search the property described and seize the uh, seize what I find that's evidence, and I'll bring you a copy of what I find. And I sign it after I swear to it. I date it, and then the judge signs it. So again, this is just kept in their chambers. This is kept with the prosecution. All right, and then the final thing is the receipt. The receipt is what happens when we actually execute the search warrant. We talk about uh, very itemized um, descriptions of what we're taking and where we retrieve them from, and the purpose is so that we leave a copy with the person so they know what we seized, and we also give a copy to the court. Obviously, the prosecution can have a copy if they want, but you a copy in your case file if you're a detective, and um, that way, Uh, everything is on the up and up. Of course, you're going to put the evidence into the evidence room anyway. Now, in the Trump case, uh, I do believe their attorneys, uh, Trump's attorneys, were standing outside for a very long time in the hot Florida sun. And as they wrapped up their investigation, the FBI wrapped up their search, they provided a receipt that was very vague, that that was just kind of like five boxes with miscellaneous papers. And sometimes that works to the benefit of the investigators. That's the that's kind of what happens. I'll talk about the execution of a search warrant in a, in a separate uh, video because I want to maybe give a, a little bit more detail. I definitely don't want to give away investigative information or, or tactics or, or how we do things because I want the cops to be safe. Serving a search warrant is a completely different beast than just writing a search warrant. This was about writing a search warrant. This is about what it takes to get into somebody's residence. Um, the waiver of the Fourth Amendment to, to convince the courts that you have probable cause, and that's what this is about. So, I'm Drew Breezy. I want you to like and subscribe to this Failure to Stop channel because we want to keep providing content just like this for you. Share it with all of your friends. Use it as a refresher or, or just use it as hypnosis at night to fall asleep. I'm Drew Breezy. Keep your Cleotha clean. Guns up, giddy up. Till next time.